All right, you guys, here we are. I'm at the bottom of page nine. This is a, a significance test for means problem. This is the bottom of page nine in your chapter nine packet. So almost at the very end of the packet, um, we've got a large school district who has implemented a new math curriculum and they are comparing standardized test scores. And what's important to note about this is we've got random selection of 500 students. Um, the mean difference, anytime you guys see a difference where they're trying to compare to um, in this case, test scores, post-test minus pre-test. So they're taking the second test, like the end of the year final or whatever, subtracting the pre-test. And since our mean difference here is 0.9, um, that means that it's since it's a positive number, think about like common sense wise, that means that our post-test scores were higher than our pre-test scores. And that's pretty common, especially for math. Usually before you've learned anything, your pre-test scores are pretty low, but after you've learned the stuff, you do much better on the post-test. We've got a sample mean here of this 500 students. We've got a sample standard deviation here. We have to determine whether these results are significant. So like, did this happen just by chance? Or is there actually a significant increase in standardized test scores, post-test minus pre-test, after this new curriculum that they're implementing? 5% level, remember that's our alpha, and the first thing we do whenever we start out by doing a significance test is we define all the stuff. So we're going to define the X, the mu, and the population. And so I am going to give you a little bit of, I guess, a, a time-saving or um, handwriting-saving tip here. When you're defining what your X is, if you make it really clear what the population is within your definition of X, you don't have to state again what the population is. Just make it really clear in here. Unless the question specifically asks, define the population, then just make sure that it's very clear in your definition of X. And the mu of X, since we already defined X here, this is the same X, it's the same variable. It's the mean difference in scores. Make sure you always um, point out the direction that you're subtracting post-test minus pre-test. Okay, so um, what we also have to do is do our little opening statement, if you will. What kind of test are we doing and why? And remember, we had a sentence that we said we were doing an interval also, and the really important key word for doing intervals was making an estimation, if you're trying to estimate something. And then you have to signify the difference between a population or, or a, a pr proportion or a mean. In this case, we're not estimating something. We are testing something. So we're testing a claim. And again, determine whether this is a proportion question or a mean question. And so these are not percentage numbers. Um, these are means. It's a mean score difference post-test minus pre-test. So this is a means problem. So I'm going to write that intro sentence also. So in this case, we are testing a claim about a population mean. Remember that the, we're going to be using a t-test since we aren't given the standard deviation of the population, only the sample standard deviation. So since our sigma x is unknown, we only have a um, sample standard deviation. That is why we're using a t-test for means. So yeah, we're going to have to use um, t-cdf in the calculator instead of normal cdf because it's not exactly a normal distribution. It is a t-distribution. Okay, so we've got to check our, or we've got to write our ho and our ha, and then check some conditions. And so the null hypothesis in this case is going to be that there's no difference. No difference between post-test and pre-test. We're not given an average from years prior to try and compare this to. We're just trying to see is there a difference or not. Is it a significant difference? So our ho is going to be the difference. Um, the average difference is zero. Remember the ho is always an equation. And then in the wording of the question up here, it doesn't lead you to think that the district is hoping for improvement or even though that's kind of obvious, uh, it doesn't say the, the district thinks that the new math curriculum sucks and that score is declined. We're just testing, is there a difference strictly? We don't know if we are swayed to the right or to the left in order to be greater than or less than. So in this case, our ho is going to be a, or our ha is going to be a two-sided test, the mu of x not equal to zero. So here's how I'm writing the ho and the ha. I am using the mean difference, assuming that there is no difference. That's what the ho is. And then the ha is, is there a difference? Remember that the ho is always an equation, always has an equal sign. Um, and then in this case, we're not swayed to the left or to the right. This is a two-sided test. Remember, that means I'm going to have to double my p-value at the end. Probably the most common mistake on this semester is people that forget to double the p-value in the event of a two-sided test. So that's why I always put myself like a little caution sign. 
Okay, conditions, you ready for them? Random, I gotta write some of this stuff out, but we do have a random selection of five hundo. It is reasonable to um, assume that there are more than 5,000 students in the district. Um, so 10% condition is met. And then for normality, what are we supposed to do here? Um, does it say the population distribution of mean difference of scores is normal? No. So next scenario is, can we use the CLT? Yes, our sample size is big enough. So I'm going to pause and write that all out. So here's my conditions. Let me zoom in a little bit so it's easier to see. I did uh, random, independent, normal, just as we discussed. Here's what I would write for the normal condition. We're not sure if the distribution itself is normal or not, but the CLT applies here. And then it would probably be a good idea to say like what it is you know about the CLT applying to this problem. So just remember the AP and exam, you're trying to show off all your stats knowledge. And so just by saying CLT, okay, true, but let's make it really, really clear that you understand that our sample size is much bigger than 30, which is the cutoff for the CLT. And um, that means that it is safe to use T. We are using T again, it's a T test because the sigma X is unknown, okay? So now finally, after all of our conditions and all of that madness, we are now allowed to do some math. So I'm gonna write some statistics off to the side and then use our test statistic formula to plug the numbers in and go from there. So here's some stats that I've kind of written out to the side. I recopied the mean difference, which is 0.9, that's given in the question. I recopied the standard deviation of the difference, that was 12. It's also just a good habit to write what the degrees of freedom is and what the alpha is. Um, just to be really clear and thorough in your work, um, the degrees of freedom here, remember, is sample size minus one, so it's 499. We'll use that to check our answer in the calculator much later. Um, but the calculator will ask you when you do the test what the degrees of freedom is. It's also a good idea to state which alpha you're using because that's going to be used in your conclusion, as you know. But we're going to say that we're going to use 0.05 since none is given. Um, and then just remember the test statistic is this T thing that we're calculating. It's a Z for proportions, but for means when you don't know standard deviation, we are going to use a T, but it's still the same formula that is from the formula sheet. Statistic minus parameter over standard deviation of statistics. So I'm just going to plug in my stuff. The statistic I was given was the X bar. The parameter is the mu X from the ho. And the standard deviation is the sample standard deviation that we're given divided by root n. And so this is what we're plugging into our formula. And so remember our x bar, that was the mean difference. Um, that was 0.9. The number from the hoe that we're using that we're just testing, is there a difference or not? That was zero. So yeah, you don't even really need to write the zero, but you can if you just like to plug numbers in. Sample standard deviation was the 12 over the root n. I guess this should probably be a d right here, since that's what I labeled it as above. Um, okay, and the root n was 5 hundo. So I'm going to put that inside the radical, and that gives me 1.677. So remember that that number is the test statistic by definition, and that works kind of like a z-score. It is a z-score when you're doing a normal distribution, but since this is a t distribution, remember those tails are a little bit fatter, so it's not exactly a z-score. Remember just what that means is, you don't have to draw this, but what this means is if the difference is zero right in the middle, our test statistic is 1.67, something like this and we're shading this direction and so we need to figure out what our p-value is and so in this case the probability that the test statistic is greater than or equal to 1.677 what you do is t cdf in the calculator and it works just like normal cdf but this is t cdf in the calc so it's a different type of distribution remember there's more shaded area here in the tails than in a normal distribution um, but that's what you're typing into the calculator, and it gives you a p-value of 0.047. And so that means that this shaded area right here is 0.047, so like almost 5%. Okay, do you remember the most common mistake in this section or from this whole semester when you're doing a two-sided test? That means that you have to double the p-value. So here's our p-value, 0.047. It's right here. Remember that we're shading to the right, 
and we're also needing to draw a line over here symmetrically and shade to the left. That's why you double your p-value. So what I'm going to do is actually draw that just to remind myself. It's the same exact number over here, but that is why you double the p-value because our shaded area accounts for both tails. Okay, so what I need to do is multiply this number by 2, and that is going to give me my p-value, which is 0.094. And I'm going to label that p-value. Okay, so make a big note about this 2 because we have a two-sided test. Boom. That means that when you crunch your p-value, you need to double it because you need to take into account both tails, this one and this one. That's what a two-sided test is. That's why we wrote not equals in our alternate hypothesis. Okay, so now you're thinking to yourself, is this p too low? So what was our alpha again? 0.05. Here's our p-value, 0.09. Is the p-value too low? No, it is not. So we do not reject the hoe. Yes, I said it on YouTube. We do not reject the hoe here. Um, our p-value is bigger than alpha. So I'm going to pause and write out the conclusion right here. Here's what my conclusion looks like. Remember, you always say like what the p-value is and how it compares to the alpha. Since the p-value is 0.094, yes, that's the doubled p-value because it takes into account both tails, is greater than alpha, which is 0.05. That means we fail to reject. The p is not too low, so we do not reject. We fail to reject the null. And then remember, when you fail to reject, that just means you restate what the null was. The null said there was no difference. So I'm just restating in words, there is no significant difference in test scores. So mention something about context here. What are we talking about? Are we talking about smoking cigarettes? Are we talking about the number of um, people who call in to vote for American Idol? Like add some context into the question. This is a significant difference in test scores. Remember another way to write that conclusion with might come up in multiple choice um, answers is do you have significant evidence or not? In this case, we do not have evidence. When you reject, that means that you found something significant, so you reject. When you fail to reject, that kind of is like almost inconclusive. Like, okay, we don't have enough information to reject, so in this case, we're failing to reject the null, and we are not coming up with evidence of a significant difference. Okay? So now let's get into this uh, cause word here. Can we conclude the new curriculum is the cause of the apparent increase in scores? So even though our sample had some sort of an apparent increase, uh, we did decide that the increase was not significant enough to make us think that the curriculum was working. So sucks to be the district. They implemented a whole new math curriculum and it turns out, according to our test, that it did not give a significant difference between post-test and pre-test. Um, so anyways, but I'm seeing a really important word here in stats, and that is the word cause. And you got to think all the way back to chapter four when we learned how you were able to establish causation. Do we have random assignment in this scenario? Did we randomly assign like half the students to have the new curriculum and the other half to do the old and have this controlled experiment? We did not. We do not have random assignment here. We just made all the students do this new curriculum and then it turns out it sucked. So um, that is a whole nother issue. But in this case, I want to just remind you guys, we do have an AP exam at the end of the year and we can't forget stuff from first semester. And that word cause is a big one. You have to have random assignment of treatments in order to use the word cause. And so just something for you to copy down for your notes packet because it's important and it's definitely going to come up on the AP. We do not have random assignment. You have to have random assignment in order to have causation. That's from chapter four. We did not randomly assign anything in this scenario. Um, therefore, we absolutely cannot use that word cause. Okay, and just make a note to yourself, even if we rejected the null and even if we did come up with a significant difference in post-test minus pre-test and our test said something like, oh, we do think that the scores have increased due to the new math curriculum. Because we do not have random assignment, we still could not say that it is a cause. We would just say for some reason there is some sort of a correlation here, but we would have to do a more controlled experiment in order to use that word cause. Okay, So hopefully you remembered that and you caught that word. That is a big one, really important right away. But that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you for watching. Bring your questions to class and I'll see you later.